Good afternoon, everyone. We have 54 people who have joined. Uh, that's a record for us, that's awesome. Before we go ahead and get started with our monthly GSE meeting, uh, I have invited GIS, Andy, and one more person, uh, Amy, I believe, have been invited to speak with us and to talk to us about the impact of the shortage of interpreters with GIS. At our previous meeting, Andy was here and gave us some information um, about what GIS is doing to try to... Uh, if you could spotlight, please, before you continue. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay. Yol, do you mind spotlighting me, please? Perfect. Thank you. So as I was saying, um, they've been struggling with resources. And then our last meeting, Andy from GIS uh, talked about uh, a lot of important information that was good for us. So it's important enough for us to invite him to come back and to share that information with you uh, in terms of what they are doing to help with this situation that we're facing and what we can do down the road. So with that, I will ask Andy and Amy to go ahead and come on screen. I can't see Jared. If you wouldn't mind if we could stop the share screen. Right, you all do you mind stopping the share screen? This is Jared. Is that better? Yes, we have uh, content to share. If you could give me uh, permission. Uh, I believe they've already set that up. Oh, great. Thank you. Hello, GSC. Long time no see. Well, hopefully I'll see you soon, but uh, again, for those that have I've not yet met, I'm Andy Shrew, uh, COO here with GIS, uh, Operations Manager, and I used to be HR Specialist, and I'm here with GIS about a year and a half ago, here with my colleague, the other Associate Director. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Amy Parsons. I'm Deaf, and I am Associate Director at GIS, new to Gallaudet new to the United States, not new to the field of interpreting. Um, I moved here from Canada and uh, joined the staff at Gallaudet and the U.S. community recently. Right, and both of us uh, are new to GIS and our roles here. We oversee all of the operations of interpreting services. Uh, we have a team approach to that, looking at quality and intention and growth of providing services uh, to Gallaudet as needed. A lot of GIS participants now. Hello, everyone. Yes, hey, shout out to GIS. Yeah, so last month, the GSC um, and their discussions uh, were not sure about the capabilities of GIS being able to meet all of the needs uh, for services at Gallaudet. So we've brought uh, news today, many overlapping factors to consider. Number one was COVID pandemic. The interpreting field itself is changing. Gallaudet is also changing with their strategic plan and focus to become all encompassing. And then there's also lots of other events that are happening right now. On top of all of this, uh, we have you know live in person and we have virtual uh, interpreting and uh, while in the past everything was in person now we're dealing with the you know the hybrid of providing courses online and services and meetings so before I continue uh, with the with this GSC had asked us to talk about the scarcity of interpreters it's not really accurate uh, I think the discussion we're having now is really about how we need to work together as a community 
GIS and Gallaudet uh, as a whole to move forward together. Not to be uh, adversaries or to place blame. We're in this together. So if you could please uh, keep that in the forefront of your mind as we move forward. I wanted to recognize that uh, you know, before COVID, we were moving along. Uh, I think we met, you know, 95% of the requests, 98% of requests, um, and then COVID hit, and everything shifted. Interpreters' roles, our roles, what the departments are doing, uh, information that wasn't yet decided, uh, new information that came along. So all of us are trying to adjust as necessary to meet the needs and every semester has it's changed too and it's changed in the way of you know this virtual or hybrid delivery of courses and things change pretty quickly we were working from home during COVID, and still we're still in COVID, but we're no longer working remotely and we find ourselves working more um, And the work is also at home too. So being involved with many projects, uh, many cross collaborations and efforts that still carry over today when we uh, come back together in person. So I wanted to mention that and uh, we have a PowerPoint to share specifics with you, uh, statistics over the last three years to help you see a bigger picture of where GIS is and how the university uh, is using uh, this resource of interpreting services. October, uh, September, October, November 2019, then 2020 and 2021 numbers. Once we show that, then we'll also talk about some temporary measures and temporary steps that GIS is in the process of uh, that perhaps from outside of GIS you're not familiar with. So we'll talk about that down the road as well. Thank you. Right. So some of these slides are um, text heavy. The numbers may be hard to read for some of you, uh, but I will present a copy uh, to Jared for the GSC, which can then be distributed that you'll be able to take a look at um, in more detail when you have time. All right, let's see if this works. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can someone tell me if you can see the PowerPoint or not? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Joshua, yes, we can. This is Amy. Can you click on presenter view though so that the thumbnails on the uh, far left side are hidden? My apologies. I thought I did that. Sorry about that. No worries if you can't, that's all right. Yeah, it seems as if uh, there was a glitch in how I did that. So I can stop sharing or do it again, but uh, there was certain things we wanted to emphasize here. Again, comparing a three months of, of 2019, 2020, and 2021. The blue colored bars is the total number of requests. In September of 2019, we had 9,395 requests for interpreting services. 
we had 336 requests that we were not able to fulfill. So that's 9,700 that we filled for that month. So you'll see the blue and yellow bars. Now remember 2019 was in person, 2020 we were completely virtual and in 2021 we are a combination of both. So that's important to keep in mind when looking at these numbers. In person, we would meet 95 to 98% of the request. Amy? Yes, um, can we talk about uh, the column? Yeah, that. can you highlight the one that you've mentioned and then the one next to that? Yes, that one. So the first four. Okay. Yeah, 2019, we're in person, the numbers are high. In 2020, we were virtual, the numbers are lower, which means at that time, we weren't, um, you know, we were thrown into operating this way and we needed to figure out how to work uh, together. And then we came back in person September 2021. So see the numbers 7,782 uh, requests were met and 217 of those were not. So you could, uh, 1,714 were not. So you can see here our available resources for interpreting services, including uh, deaf, deaf blind, closed vision, voicing, translation work, captioning, all of the services that we provide. And with COVID, the impact on all of us, uh, really personally and you know, in our work life, with our families, our children, others that we're taking care of, guardians, family members, extended family being in the same house together, taking care of each other with no child care or other impacts of COVID that needed to be dealt with, uh, that often has, that also had an impact with the interpreting field. People see interpreters as language commodities, meaning they are a product of services. We provide a service, it's true. What they provide is a service, but you have to remember we are not a product, we are humans, we are people as well, with lots going on, just like everyone else does as well. So again, I wanted to emphasize that, that when we came back, Gallaudet, the District of Columbia and the nation were unsure about how we were gonna make it through this COVID epidemic together with no childcare, with, no, with the schools closed. But the interpreting field is changing so much. Now we're experiencing a shift in the first generation of interpreters from the 60s up until about 2010, 2020, and now we're in another generation, a second generation of interpreters that are coming into the field. And it's a completely different world. And we're right in the middle. Some people chose to retire. Some people decided to become interpreters. So we have a mix of that here. Some freelance interpreters, some that are just contract, some that are staff. So, and the, every interpreter has a different reason for choosing the way they work. So within GIS, those are the types of uh, interpreting services we provide. Anything else, Amy? Sure, uh, those were excellent points that you covered. I do wanna emphasize that the impact of COVID also impacted how we schedule jobs. For example, before COVID, you know, if somebody had, you know, like a cold, they would show up to work anyway. But with COVID, Gallaudet is very strict, you know, in keeping us healthy and safe and together. So that means when a person took a health assessment, it would say, no, you can't come into work. Um, and so they'd have to try to get, we'd have to try to get somebody to replace them or to double up schedules or, you know, to at the last minute to say, I'm sorry, we don't have anyone available. And if we were like, why are there no interpreters? Well, GIS, we are also accountable to our staff. We have staff and freelancers. 
um, and they all have individual situations, but it does have an impact on the Gallaudet community at large. And we definitely recognize that. I mean, as deaf people, we recognize the sensitivity of the subject of not having an interpreter. And we recognize how COVID has truly impacted the relationship between consumers and interpreters. We are still continuing to have a discussion um, amongst others about how we can navigate that journey. And that's where we are now. The big picture of what's happening on campus regarding interpreters is a new situation. It's not something we were facing before. There's you know many different projects. There's consultants. Uh, there's processes. There's renovations and uh, mergers and and new academic programs and new schools being set up and academic reviews and MSCHE accreditation. All of that is happening around the same time. So of course, there's an increased need while our interpreting services is either maintained or has um, our pool of resources have become less. So we can't uh, meet everyone's needs right now, but we are working with outside agencies to also try and cover this need. In the DMV area, there's a lot of agencies uh, that work with the same pool of interpreters that GIS does in this area. Right, not everyone has their own pool of interpreters. It's one large pool of interpreters that we all work from. That's right. And when we submit requests, when we get requests, we do send out these requests to agencies and sometimes agencies don't pick up the work and sometimes they do which is great when they do, but it's a crapshoot at this point, And it really all depends on uh, what information we have in the request, uh, the, the type of interpreters that we need for that request, if it's in person or virtual, or if it's a hybrid, how is that gonna work? Um, the requests that we have, you know, is, is say, we need three interpreters for this meeting. How do you know you need three interpreters. I mean, oftentimes you'll see our scheduling team reach out and say, can you please share the agenda? Can you please tell us who will be there? And what are the roles and what's the purpose of the meeting? All of those details are important for us to make decisions and placement of interpreters. So I'm asking for your help. We need information. We need more information and requests to be able to fulfill them appropriately. If you don't know some of the answers, like when an event will be exactly. But, you know, if there's something for an event that you need, submit the request. And then you can add details as we move along, because the sooner we know about it, the better. And that will help us moving forward in terms of availability and seeing why we can uh, place interpreters. When you submit a request uh, for uh, that's Less than three days away, that's pretty unreasonable for us. Interpreters are already booked with other requests uh, or they have their own you know, plans. They're, they're out for other reasons. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And yes, you know, a lot of things are happening, but if you're planning something and you didn't know within three days, you knew more than three days ago. And we would just like to know more than three days ago as well to give us plan, uh, to give us time to plan the services. Right, I saw a couple comments that have come up in the chat, uh, who says, if there are meetings on Zoom, can you send your request out, not only to the DMV area, but outside of this area? And another person said, yes, that would be great because you know that's the silver lining of Zoom meetings is going outside of DMV. Um, and often, um, if those some, and somebody often says, often we submit requests months in, exam, in advance and then told right away, right before it occurs, that it's not going to be filled. Right. So we have an obligation, you know, to confirm using staff and freelance. Uh, sometimes people have a double workload because of a modality, because of the resources. So if we have someone come on campus, for example, um, and maybe we, they're working in the third floor of Pete Hall, doing something virtual, and then they go to an in-person assignment on campus, they have to go somewhere else. Um, we're trying to offer access to the campus at large, but GIS as a service provider to the campus community is just like GTS or any other department. We don't just independently decide how we're gonna shift our approach. 
But now that we're both in person and virtual, and there's that overlap in terms of resources, sometimes we're just not in a position now that we've come back in person and we've been back in person for what, some nine months? Uh, it's still rocky. You know, um, some of us are back in person, but not everyone is back in person. So it's really still a hybrid model. So to answer your question, yes, we do send that out. Um, and somebody else said, you know, in terms of priority, you know, how do we um, decide, you know, if an interpreter is or is not available? Right. Sometimes there are interpreters available, but it doesn't mean they'll always pick up a job. It depends on the job. It depends on the institutional knowledge required for that job or the particular skill required for that job. And those interpreters that have that skill are not available. So I want to emphasize that just having a pool of interpreters is not plug and play. All of your requests are important. And at GIS, we're not in a position to say, to make a judgment about which is important and which is not. We have to look at all the requests and what we can do. And oftentimes, when we get back to it, we can only do one and not the other. It depends on the need and the accommodation. And if we have someone that can do that effectively, great. If not, we can't. So when you submit a request, and you, you're, you're told that requests cannot be covered, they're for different reasons. And as Amy has said, we can't disclose the reason for you know, privacy of the person itself and the university. So again, I wanna make sure that we understand that and that we are, you know, today we'll be going through a process or start a process of a, a study on how the university uh, uses interpreting services and that'll be coming up soon. And we'll also have an opportunity uh, as stakeholders, uh, as a community here at the university to talk about interpreting services as a whole, not for GIS, but as a whole for the university that's coming up. And we'd appreciate hearing your comments and feedback uh, very much so. So I'll leave it uh, with that. That's one strategy that we're working with coming up soon. Uh, yeah, that's great. And and perhaps I can wrap up with some, I know you're going to share some additional information, but somebody asked about requests for CDIs or closed vision. Um, yes, we're definitely supporting those requests. Sometimes if it's virtual versus in person, um, then we might have to have a second or third Zoom room. So then it's on the interpreters to set that up or it's the requester going to set that up. So sometimes, you know, in reaching out to others, we really encourage the requester or the consumer to set up their own separate Zoom room for the CDI so that they're ready to connect and offer those closed vision interpreting services. Every Friday, I know that there is a meeting of folks who are focusing on members of the deafblind community. Um, we have people within academic affairs and other departments who come together to talk about how they can support deafblind students you know, and how they can work whether together uh, in person or not in person and how to coordinate that. So I believe, I hope that answers your question, Felicia. I also just wanted to share that sometimes agencies in Gallaudet do experience, uh, you know, we're not, we've not been able to uh, fulfill a request because of COVID protocols that interpreter or the agency didn't meet our criteria protocols for even uh, being able to come on campus. So that was another barrier that we're experiencing today. So we're gonna move through uh, the next couple of slides pretty quickly. The next one's gonna show you a snapshot of every month of the requests. And then the second one will show how many hearing interpreters and how many deaf interpreters we have. And if you don't know, there's a big difference between both groups. And this represents uh, 20, uh, 2019 to 2021. 
Uh, you can see the blue is where we met the target. There's a last, uh, the last couple of months there. Uh, you can see we did not because we didn't have the resources available or because of COVID protocols. Uh, we weren't able to meet the need or we got a request last minute and weren't able to, to fill that. When we send out a job to agencies or our pool, we often need more than three days because by the time we send it, that agency needs time to then send it to their folks. And you know, then it takes a little bit for the interpreters to decide yes or no, and it comes back to us. And so that's you know, how we work within our staff group as well. So uh, time is important. Last minute requests often don't go unfilled. Yes, um, as I look at the numbers from 2019 to 2021, um, and you see the yellow bars on top, uh, you'll notice that we are definitely increasing in terms of the hours that we provide, but with less people. Uh, when you look at September of 2019 to September of 2021, um, you'll notice a difference in how many people, the service hours are the same, but the numbers of people are quite different. Um, and that has to do with the level of staff that we currently have. November, 2021 will look very similar to the last three months here that you see. There's a lot of unfilled requests and we'll be updating this statistic more as we go along. Next, I wanna show you a comparison of hearing interpreters and deaf interpreters in the pool, the number of, of each. The blue bars are deaf interpreters, the yellow bars are hearing interpreters. Both are very much needed. And we are challenged with the availability of this group. Oftentimes when people ask for deaf interpreting services, we have a group of maybe 18 CDIs or less. So, and that's not daily, that's just it's based on their availability. On staff, we have nine deaf interpreters. And then what we have available in the DMV area, those folks that contract and work with us. So those are the different populations. We're very restricted and CDIs as a group of deaf interpreters, nationally speaking, is also a very, very uh, mi minimal number. Uh, we need a lot more CDIs. That's a challenge that we're not only facing here, but all over. Uh, and so again, it's the generation shift. People are leaving the field, they're retiring. Maybe they've moved on to a different career, research or teaching or something else. And then we have others coming into the field that have very different needs. This last one, as I mentioned before, uh, the requests that we get uh, with less than three days notice. And we, are, we work, you know, for the last 18 months, we've been working, uh, you know, keeping documentation about this, the, the request that we get with less than three days notice. Um, sometimes we find an interpreter, sometimes we don't, or they're just not a good fit, or they're not available. So there's a lot of communication that has, has to happen very quickly uh, because of the short time frame, And it's difficult when we want to make sure that everyone has access to communication Again, we don't care about what kind of meeting it is or what kind of event it is. It's not important to us, but it is important to you. So it puts us in a hard place of deciding who gets an interpreter and who doesn't. And there's lots of different things that overlap literally and GIS are not the only decision makers in uh, delegating these interpreters. It's all based on a lot of different factors, Amy. Perhaps I can speak to that and give you an example. When we came back in person last semester, a uh, majority of the requests were still mixed, both online and in person. And so what was interesting is that at the same time, you know, all across the United States, 
Most women are female, meaning most of them perhaps are caretakers. They have children in school. And if issues come up with school where there's an exposure and the child has to come home, that then impacts them. So um, getting back to that, and then I'll let and I'll follow up later. And Andy, go ahead and finish up your point. Oh, wait, wait, I have one more thing I wanted to say. Um, so looking at this semester when we came back in person and the registration for classes just continued. Uh, it didn't seem to be a cutoff date. So often we have a cadre of interpreters that we hold until we figure out what classes they're going to be with um, during that period of time. And then we have that same pool, remember, of fewer interpreters. Then we have increasing requests and increasing last minute requests. So they, I mean, our staff, uh, is there and we're trying to divvy up the job for them. So when we think about our priority as being students, some of those students are deafblind, uh, some of those are emerging signers, um, and then we try to plug our stuff into them. Um, and then sometimes we don't get a full picture to perhaps the third or fourth week of the semester. So that negatively impacts other requests, um, most definitely. So um, that's something that we've definitely seen. It's an ongoing issue. If classes can, they continue to have ongoing registration um, or the, the deadline is shifted, um, families are impacted, people are, are using VR. I mean, especially this though, the impact of continuing registration along with staff requests, consultant requests, special project requests, all of those have had a big impact. They do. Yes. There are some questions here in the chat. One question is asking us saying, do you have any idea of the numbers of in-person requests versus versus virtual requests? Uh, to answer that, I would see uh, there's more in-person requests um, and more not in-person or more virtual requests. So with in-person interpreting, most of our staff all are in-person. All the staff come, they're in person. Our contractors, agencies that we work with is a mix. Some are in person, some are virtual. Some are only virtual. So to answer the question, I think most of our interpreting services are in person. And even though we are in person, we still do virtual work throughout the day. Uh, interpreters do, staff interpreters do, uh, even though they're here in person. And in 2019, we were completely in person. In 2020, we were completely virtual. In 2021, we've become a mix. And same with 2022 as well. So we're doing both. We're doing, yeah, both are growing, in person and virtual, as well as hybrid. So now we have an opportunity to do different things, right? The hybrid, virtual, in-person, all the options are nice right now. Gallaudet is, doesn't have a structure to provide the support for interpreting services in general. And we are still working on different strategies, recruitment, advertising, expansion, mentoring, and building uh, collaborative relationships with departments to help uh, understand, help them best understand, and so th that we can fulfill the request and go on this journey together. This is uh, Amy, who uh, there's someone who asked a question, what can re the rest of the staff do to help us? Thank you for asking that. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand that the field of interpreting uh, before COVID had already started to shift. It's more deaf centric. It's more focused on diversity and equity. Uh, and then you have the impact of COVID as well and people trying to navigate that journey. So we can't ignore that. Uh, and as Andy just mentioned, um, we're doing a study to understand that process fully. Um, also, I will say that when you submit a request, understand that we see it, but as a service providers, um, we can't say, well, I prefer this rather than other events. There are so many events that are happening at the same time. So um, if there's something happening within your department or division or unit, um, we are trying to push for some common community scheduling 
so that we can sort of understanding what's happening out there. Have If there are certain times when interviews happen or trainings happen or meetings happen, if we know those certain times, then perhaps there can be some flexibility when that's scheduled so that we like know, okay, the faculty community has these hours when it's really busy and the other community have these hours. So if we can just acknowledge what a community calendar would look like and sort of spread the hours out rather than having events and trainings and meetings and um, academic affairs and tours and all of that at the same time, perhaps you have a regular meeting or a regular project happening, but then you have a special event and it's at the same time. So we just need some breathing room. Um, and in terms of somebody asking, can we refer other interpreters? Absolutely, yes, yes. Please ask them to get a hold of me. Uh, we are definitely looking as a priority for in-person interpreters. Now uh, we do wanna communicate that Gallaudet is a safe place to come in and work. We have safety protocols in place. Um, that people can 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 work through. So yes, it definitely helps them to share, you know, about our testing ratios or rates about masking policy and all of that. And then there are people who want to work for virtually. There are some issues with that as well. Um, but definitely do refer people. Definitely yes. So again, we are asking. Um, to, for your grace and to be patient with us. And we wanna support you in the same way as much as we can uh, to ensure that we're giving each other the luxury of time and information and able to engage uh, and communicate the way that we need to. It's not gonna be easy for some or, or easy for part of this. The other part may, may be okay. So the change comes with you, the requesters or your department to make sure that we have the full information both on your end and my end to help us figure out together what we can do more overall uh, together, not separately. And I do want to not acknowledge that what Amy just shared in the last you know, 20 minutes, of course, it brings more questions than answers for you uh, as often is the case. So we do want to continue this conversation with you, uh, you know, maybe in another forum or in another uh, way, uh, but, but please reach out. We want to acknowledge each of your questions uh, the, and the questions that come or, or the requests that come to us are so different. Uh, there's a variety of needs and attention that needs to be given to your requests. This is Amy, Dom wants to say a few words. Thank you, Dom, and hello. Well, of course, it would be hard not for me, you know, to just sit here and not say anything. So first of all, I would like to say, you know, it's amazing to see, you know, the number of people who are here today and watching this conversation. I appreciate you being here. Um, secondly, I'm sorry, let's get rid of the share screen. So there's more real estate for us. Okay, go ahead, Dom. All right. Are we okay now? Okay. So first of all, I wanna thank everyone for your participation in being here and watching uh, the presentation by the GIS team. Um, I know as Andy mentioned, it's been difficult for everyone, you know, to think about uh, getting the best services, um, having the best access. And GIS wants that for you. But I also want to mention that we are investing a lot of time and resources uh, into GIS and looking at how we can make changes within the organization to better accommodate the needs of the university. So many things are changing, you know, in terms of uh, the workload and what will happen this semester and throughout the summer, there'll be changes made in order to improve that. So as Andy mentioned, we really thank you for your grace and for your understanding and ask for your patience as well. Um, nobody more than GIS really wants this. Uh, wants everyone to have access. Um, they don't want you to have a negative experience. Um, so what we're asking is for your continued support as we do the work. Um, and what we're asking is that you recognize the fact that interpreters, when they do show up, um, many times, you know, in my work at Gallaudet, we have that expectation that interpreters just show up and robotically do their work. But when we think about interpreters, they're a part of the community as well. So give them some time, say thank you to the interpreters. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you've done. 
And the third thing I would like to say is because we're trying to grow the pool of interpreters that we have, we have some new interpreters who don't have that institutional knowledge. So what we want to do is make sure that those newer interpreters feel that they can be a part of our community. Welcome them, help them, support them in gaining institutional knowledge. We will not succeed unless if we are recruiting new interpreters who are not familiar with us, they're not familiar with our language, they're not familiar with our jargon, they're not familiar with our acronyms, they're not familiar with who people are on campus. So make sure when you see interpreters who are new, also support them, support their journey as they work on campus so that this is a place where they want to come work. Thank you, Dom, yeah. I also want to acknowledge other people that are involved in this process as well, scheduling team and your planning team and our planning team, they're all equally important in all of this as well to make services go well. Thank you, Amy. Absolutely, and this is Amy, yes. I'd like to share something that maybe some people don't recognize. Before COVID began, GIS was already starting as an organization to go through transformation and to become more deaf-centric and to become more diverse. In fact, our current leadership, the leadership team is majority deaf, majority not white, uh, and majority of various genders. So now that we're gathered together face to face and there is a smaller pool of interpreters because of COVID, we think, great, we've got this change happening, this transformation, but internally we're going through some growing pains as well as a new leadership team. So within the Gallaudet community, we're trying to support the Gallaudet promise. We're trying to recruit people into our community. So it's a very exciting time, a very exciting place to be. And I do hope that you'll support us as we support Gallaudet. Thank you all. Thank your team. Uh, I know it's not, we've not been easy for you. Thank you for your support, GIS. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Jared and go off screen. But again, thank you. Some people uh, arrive late after we start, but we will be sharing our PowerPoint with Jared who will then share it with the GSC. Please feel free to contact us anytime if you're I'm sure the numbers are want some further clarification. We're happy to do that. Sis Jared, thank you so much to the two of you for coming and talking about the struggles that GIS has been undergoing um, for a while. Um, and I think this is going to help staff better to understand how to deal with it and to offer grace as you ask for. Um, so thank you for the examples. If we can refer interpreter to, that's great that we can increase the pool of interpreters and then that will decrease the issues that we're facing currently. So 88 people have come to this meeting today. So that clearly shows how important this issue is to the community and to so many of us. Yeah, so I, I appreciate I appreciate you. I appreciate you yeah, being here. We've said it all. And this is Amy. Um, while we're here as a community, as someone asked about figuring out how to come up with some way to uh, show multiple requests or something so that people know. So yeah, there's we've got to figure out a way to, to do that so that people know um, if there are multiple impacts that GIS is facing scheduling. So thank you for that comment. Thank you. All right, um, let's see. I need someone to take the spotlight off you all on Andy and Amy, please. Thank you much. So now with that, we're gonna go ahead and start the monthly GSC meeting. The time that we are starting is 1.17 p.m. And today is March 8th. Uh, we do have a quorum of representatives here, I believe. Can that be confirmed, Joshua? Excellent. Joshua West says, yes, we do. All right. So let's see. I am going to go ahead and share my screen.
And would you mind going ahead and opening up the slide that has the minutes so that folks can see what happened at the last minute so we can get approval on the minutes. Right and scroll up. Right, can I have a vote for approval in a minute, please? All right, so Jacqueline has moved uh, approval of the minutes and we've had a second. Thank you. Um, would you mind stopping that screen share, please, Yo? Yo? Can you stop the screen share? Okay, thank you. Now we'll go on to the chair's report. There's been some uh, changes to the parental leave policy um, and GSE reps did review that. Uh, we also obtained feedback from other members of our staff. Um, and uh, HR is now in the process of finalizing it now that it has been approved and they will announce that soon with new, de new details as well. Uh, a couple members of staff came up to us recently um, to talk about the reevaluation policy. And right now we uh, have our own internal discussion about that. We will reach out to HR to get more information from them um, and see how they respond to those two policies. Um, we also are finding out that remote employees are paid 15% less uh, than if they were living in the DMV area and present on campus. A uh, few people who work remotely saying that in DC, that's not only DC, um, I mean, DC is, has a high cost of living area um, and quite expensive. And so they're wondering why that policy of 15% is being applied uniformly to all remote employees. 
So they're asking them to reevaluate that program um, and um, uh, also to talk about, you know, how it impacts them when they're in town for a short time and they work in person, they're not paid per diem while they're here in town. Um, so right now, as I said, we're in discussion with HR about those policy reevaluations. Now, if I can speak to the leave sharing program, uh, that's a program where employees donate, you know, their annual leave to other employees who are in desperate need of hours. They can request um, to use those hours through the leave sharing program. So we got a few questions in that regard. Uh, one was, what is the status of the donated hours? Um, are they being used? Will those hours, if they stay in touch in the program, will they stay there until they're donated? Um, or are they sometimes lost? Um, others would like to see some kind of uh, transparency in terms of reporting those hours uh, to make sure that those hours are truly being used. And that is one way to boost morale on campus, as well as to show our community that we care about one another. We had a discussion um, with the president's office in regard to an employee appreciation event. It seems we're going to go ahead with that this year. It's going to be May 24th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, so keep that date available on your calendar. And what's going to happen on that day is we have asked Roy Lutz. Uh, Roy is deaf. Uh, he's a deaf guy who runs a barbecue business. So he's going to be coming to D.C. from Austin. And he's going to bring his barbecue grill trailer along with him. So that's one of the things happening that day. We're also going to have other fun events that day. Um, let's see, moving on to meetings that we've had. On February 23rd, I had the opportunity to meet with Adrienne Morgan. She is the chair of OESEC, the Organization for Equity for Staff of Color. And um, we we'll also met with her team as well, her executive team. So we had a discussion, it went very well. Uh, the discussion that we had was to explore a stronger connection between OESOC. Uh, during the meeting, we had some very productive, um, traded several ideas about what possible structures for that connection would look like. So OESOC will discuss that at their meeting internally, and then they'll get back to us with some proposals. Uh, and then GSC can start formalizing that partnership um, and perhaps um, see what we can do within our bylaws. Then uh, let's see, March 24th uh, is the Board of Trustees meeting. It's a webinar and GSC will be represented by the chair at that meeting. As far as updates, I have provided a link in my report. I always provide a link for transparency, transparency reasons for the FY 2021 budget, you know, what we're planning to spend, et cetera. And I will close my report um, by saying, if you have any concerns, uh, something that you'd like to discuss with us, please do fill out the GCS mission form. It can be anonymous or you can put your name on it. Um, so whatever concerns or issues you may have that GCS needs to give attention to, please let us know. That's one way that GCS can make a change at Gallaudet by gathering feedback from our staff. Thank you. Are there any questions for me? May 24th, yes, that's the employee appreciation event. Uh, we're hosting that on May the 24th. All right, any other questions? All right, seeing none, let's go back to the agenda. Uh, and now we're going to talk about um, elections. I'll have the elections report or Governance and Elections Committee report. And if we can have the spotlight on Joshua.
Okay. Yoel, if you could go ahead and stop the share screen, I'm just going to say what's uh, on the PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay, governance and election committee report. Uh, spring is coming soon. More light, seasons of change and growth. GSC elections are coming up in May. So now, of course, uh, we want to encourage you to think about joining the CSG uh, as a representative. There's one position in the secretary's position. So there's two positions. Right now, during new business, we will be proposing a timeline for elections. We're gonna open the discussion. Once that's approved, we will share that with the community on my GU. More information will be coming through uh, email through my GU. And if they have any questions, uh, please email GSC Gallaudet or GSC Gallaudet.edu. Thank you, that includes my report, thank you. All right, are there any questions for Joshua for the Governance and Elections Committee report? All right, uh, let's move on then to staff development. Spotlight Debbie and take down a share screen, please. This spring, we had more workshops. I'm sure that you've already seen uh, my GU, but I want to emphasize that one of our staff, uh, Development Committee. Taja Brown has been presenting and hosting uh, workshops. Uh, she's a person of color. You can contact her for those types of trainings. You also see the month of March, there's a listing of uh, three different trainings, budget training that happened this morning, uh, system uh, that will be happening the end of March, and then the cultural equity. And that is a, a four part series in that one. So there'll be different times you'll see here. And then the month of April, we have another two workshops. It will come up my GU. You can contact uh, the point of contact there, uh, Taja, for different um, for more information. If you're interested in presenting on a topic, please uh, reach out to the chair, GSC, or myself uh, for staff development committee. Any one of us, or Anyone in the Gallaudet community is welcome to join, to present, uh, to work with us. We, we welcome that. So to join this council first, before I make a comment, I want to thank uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Lally for uh, servicing this commission and been replaced with a new person. Matthew Terry. Thank you, Matthew, for joining. And I want to thank Jacqueline as well for all of her wonderful, wonderful services. Really enjoyed working with you very much. So please join. The more heads, the better. looking at all the different workshops and trainings that will be provided for Gallaudet staff and community. We appreciate all your help. Thank you.
All right, thank you. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to the AAMT, Academic Affairs Management Team report. And who is going to be giving that report today? Andy, great, come on up. Hello again. So first of all, I want to recognize that the information in the report, you're probably feeling now that uh, it's outdated. Some of it is. AAMT um, uh, usually is the day after the GCS meeting every month. So GCS is today, then AAMT is tomorrow, and so that's the way it goes. So some of the information may seem to be outdated. But it's important, you know, for you to decide whether it's worth it to you or not, <laughs> not up to me. So I do want to share some of the things that I have learned from um, attending those meetings. First of all, AAMT, if you're not familiar with that group, um, those are representatives from various areas of uh, academics, provost office, uh, the dean's office, from the library department, from GIS, uh, SSP, various groups on campus. Um, who directly impact and who work directly with academic affairs. So um, pretty much we rotate and doing a report and offering a summary. Um, and you'll see here a debrief from uh, what has happened during our meeting. So I'll talk about part of that. First of all, with the Office of Provost um, in terms of managing COVID, we're doing quite well. Uh, our positive percent right now is 0 0.4 percent or 0, 0 point something. So in terms of COVID, we're at, I think, 0.14, something like that. And it's even less now. So that's great. Excellent news for us. Um, so spring break will continue as planned. In fact, happening next week. Um, now, Dean of the Faculty. Right now, they're currently developing more online programs that's in the works. Um, and we don't know the specifics of that yet, um, but many of those programs that they're now developing is an online version. So that's gonna help us to recruit many students who to come in and get that education. Um, summer sessions will be face-to-face. -face. There'll be two five-week sessions, one directly behind the other. And again, they'll be face-to-face. The library uh, is going through the renovation process. I mean, the books have been moved to different places. So right now there is a temporary library in SAC. Come check it out, it's pretty cool. Um, and the full library services are still happening. They're still in operation mode. So if you need a request or if you need some materials delivered to you, that can happen. Now moving on to international affairs. Um, international affairs, uh, we want to announce that domestic travel is permitted for Gallaudet. However, international travel is also permitted, um, but those countries that identify as a level three or four under the CDC guidance, you'll need approval from the executive team for that travel. Graduate school. Um, for graduate school, uh, we have 268 degrees seeking students. Uh, we have 30 students on leave of absence for spring 2022. Um, the Faculty Senate approved two graduate programs, two new programs, and those programs will be announced pretty soon. Um, the graduate student, graduate school has also stood up an ASL immersion program for graduate students. They're developing that, um, and hopefully they're going to participate in that during the summers before classes start in the fall. Um, and summary from GIS, we're getting about 120 classes that are receiving interpreting services, um, about 15 we still have not covered at this time. Um, available interpreting services are very restricted uh, and low, not only at Gallaudet, but if you notice really throughout the US. Um, and that's due to, you know, many universities of hiring higher ed are experiencing the same issues with not having enough interpreters. Undergraduate admission. There will be an open house on February 25th. <laughs> so that date is passed, but they are going to have another one in April, and that's going to be in person. 
Um, they're also hosting virtual open houses from time to time. Those will continue to take place. Moving on to DTS. Uh, and some folks have asked about the technology backpack kits. They've got their kit, but they haven't got the monitors uh, for a variety of reasons. So the other half of our monitors actually arrived and uh, the first half arrived and they will be um, disseminating those. Um, and then when the rest of them arrive, we'll be disseminating those. Uh, let's see. Collaboration is happening, a collaboration program that they're calling the Design Lab. The purpose of that lab is when someone says, you know what, I need, you know, a platform for doing this and it needs that this specific function, then people get that. And there's a group of people who are working on it and they develop it and they create it and then they present it for use. So there's going to be more information about that Design Lab. But GTS has noticed that Gallaudet in general has too many types of software that we use. So we need to see, do we need to use all of them? Or can we you know, limit the number that we have? Um, if there's some that are in high usage, they're gonna look at those in both low usage and high usage areas and then start to uh, remove some of those after an assessment because they wanna see if it's worth it to keep them or not. Um, or if there's another platform that can replace it that has more benefits. Uh, platforms that are frequently used will be maintained. Moving on to the Gallaudet Promise, we are in the process of setting up a platform where we can actually measure uh, our progress in satisfying the Gallaudet Promise uh, in specific points of that promise. So that's exciting and coming down the road. Academic Affairs um, are working on their budget, their work in process with their workday transformation, um, focusing on people software and HR functions. So getting it ready and hoping soon that that's gonna be launched. So long report, but that's my summary for the AMT committee. Any questions? If not, I will then turn it back over to Jared. Maybe. Jared? Okay. Great. So now I'd like to ask about the assessment of the platforms. When will more information be shared regarding that? And what's that process look like? When will uh, and how can I find out about that process? Andy, okay, can you uh, Andy, did you want to answer that question? This is Jared. Sure. Yeah, this conversation just started. So how the how haven't been quite worked out yet, but hopefully we'll get an update tomorrow uh, when we meet again. And then I'll share that in the next report, but I will also, if they mention something, I'll let you know directly. I'll give you an update. Thank you. No problem. All right, thanks. Okay, so if we can remove the spotlight, can we remove the spotlight from Amber and Andy, please? Yoel, you still have a spotlight on Amber and Andy. Can you remove those spotlights, please? Awesome. Okay. And put the spotlight on Jacqueline. Excellent. There we go. Hello, everyone. Last night, the Faculty Senate meeting Usually it's three hour meeting. It went way over three hours. It was a long evening. A lot of this discussion got into faculty handbook changes uh, with the language 
through the faculty well, welfare committee. There was a lot of discussion there. But uh, CUE and CGE give, gave their reports on program changes, uh, removal of some prerequisites for some of the program, uh, minor changes. Uh, one accomplishment yesterday I uh, learned at the top, the graduation will be face-to-face -face this year. It will be on May 13th and it'll be in two parts. A morning graduation will be graduate students from nine to 11 and in the afternoon, undergraduate students from one to four. That was the most significant uh, information I think that applies to staff because staff are involved all in the preparation of graduation and that time's coming up pretty soon. So be aware of, uh, you know, uh, May 13th and other dates that are coming up. Awards are the end of April or so. Uh, so that kind of thing. Other than that, nothing much to report from Faculty Senate. Any questions? Any questions for Jacqueline? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. All right, can you take the spotlight off of Jacqueline? Great, yeah, and stop the screen share as well. Mm, yeah, spotlight off Jacqueline, great. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over. Well, actually wanna ask if there are any comments or concerns or issues that anyone wants to discuss uh, at this time, it's your opportunity to do that. And you can either bring your video up or type it in the chat. This is our pulse check. Seeing none. Right, any comments that you wanna make, you bring your video up or you can put it into the chat. Okay, all right. Um, we have no old business to discuss, so we will move on to new business. And we have two pieces of new business. First of all, uh, Joshua, take it away. This is Joshua, sure, I wait to be spotlit. Thank you. I'm also the chair of the Governance and Elections Committee, and I'd like to make a proposal for GSC to approve the proposed election timeline that we have ready so that uh, maybe just look it over real quick, or I can just tell you uh, in a nutshell what it is, uh, but any new concerns that may come up, uh, but I wanna bring it up for open discussion uh, if, if that will work now. Uh, first of all, uh, Joshua, can we put your proposal on screen? Thank you, y'all. Thank you. And we need a second. Um, first of all, can we we show the entire uh, proposed election timeline, y'all? Okay, uh, any discussion? If none, uh, someone needs to move that we close discussion on this issue first. This is Yol, I move that we close. Great, Yol has uh, sent a motion to close the discussion. It has been, we need a second. Second. All right, Jamie has seconded. Let's vote um, for everyone here. We can have everyone come on screen. Zero, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, a motion to close discussion passes. 
also wanted to add uh, to this the uh, community on MyGU this week. Uh, it will be hosted there. So take a look there as well. Thank you. All right, our second item of new business was Elvia. Uh, for the events recognition committee to host an event for staff. I'm sorry, this is Jacqueline. Can somebody spotlight Elvia? Yes, yeah, give us a moment. Okay, better now? I move. I move for the events committee to host an event for staff to be scheduled with a budget for up to $3,000 for the event. Okay, is there any discussion of that uh, motion? If no discussion, can someone move that we close the discussion? I close discussion. This is Yo, I second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded, and now we'll go ahead and vote on the proposal. Um, all in favor? Nine passes, all right. Thank you. Um, so that completes our new business. So the next date for our meeting is going to be on April the 12th at 1230 p.m. that Tuesday. And that concludes our meeting at 150 p.m. Thank you for everyone who came. Goodbye, all.